um, without further ado, I, I would like to just to introduce everybody to Enzo Liverino. Um, I will ask him. I will ask him um, to join us for uh, for just a little while, just just for 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 us to introduce him, because he will he will um, be with us uh, after. Uh, sorry, I have to press the right buttons. So he will be with us uh, in uh, in a few minutes after I do an introduction um, of the topic that he will be uh, uh, then addressing. And Enzo, good morning, buongiorno. Buongiorno, Rui. Uh, good morning, Gaetano. Good morning, Edward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rui, to invite me to this webinar. And uh, I am very honored uh, to uh, uh, share with uh, everybody uh, the beauty of uh, uh, coral. Uh, as Rui say, uh, 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 me and my family, uh, we, we have the coral in our blood. Maybe it's true, maybe it's true. Um, any, anyway, uh, we have a very strong passion in, uh, in uh, coral. And uh, what my father teaches us, me and uh, my son Basilio that is with us today, um, we like to share with everybody uh, how uh, how beautiful is it, the coral? So it's a real thank. We thank you. It's a real privilege to to have you here on the uh, for one hour with us and sharing your your vast knowledge. So that for us, it's a really opportunity. And we see that you are already on your museum on the secret place in Torre del Greco, where you have that treasure. And you will guide us through through the museum in a couple of minutes. So thank you very much for being there. Thank you, Dr. Caetano Cavalieri. Thank you, Edward Johnson. I'm going to kill all the video feeds of our panelists, and I will be back with you, Enzo, in a couple of minutes. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. So today, we are, uh, our topic is Mediterranean corals, and uh, we will cover a few things, and I will try to be real quick on this, uh, on this uh, first uh, part of the webinar, so we will have the privilege to hear Enzo in a couple of minutes. I will explain real quick what is a precious coral and what are the precious coral species of the Mediterranean that we know it's a Corallium rubrum, that's the Italian name. For those of you that are biologists, you see the Corallium rubrum written without italics and maybe you are like this. It was my mistake, but it doesn't matter. Then, of course, we will speak, as Caetano Cavalieri said, all too well, the history and lore and symbolism of coral throughout the globe. It's not only on the areas where coral was harvested, actually it's all across the globe that um, coral has had since really uh, remote time in history, a really strong symbolism of, of course, when you have symbolism and spirituality, you have art. So we will also see pieces of art, you know, some are jewelry, some are sculptures made with precious coral from the Mediterranean. And uh, also, Caetano said that uh, in a special area in the Sicily Channel, uh, near Sciacca, which is a town uh, um, uh, in the south of the island of Sicily, a um, special type of coral was discovered, and uh, we will also discuss it uh, by the end of this webinar. So, um, this is really complicated, this slide. You look at this and you think, whoa, complicated words, and they are. But this is actually what coral is. Coral are the skeleton or the exoskeleton of animals that we call polyps. And that's what they are constituted of. They are biomineralized calcium carbonate and a few organic matter molecules that I'm not going to, to say all, all those names, really complicated ones. But basically it's a biogenic gem material. Those of you that studied gemology, maybe you, 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 you learned that pearls, corals, tortoise shell, ivory, they are organic gem materials. But Sibjo, in 2016, uh, a deliberation was issued that the better and more accurate word to classify those materials is biogenic. And why? Because coral 
uh, although it has organic molecules like some proteins, it is essentially constituted by a biomineralization, meaning it's a rock. So it's not organic in composition. So it's more accurate to call it biogenic. That's why today Sibju calls uh, all these materials, especially coral, pearl, cultured pearl, and shell, including matter of pearl, we call them biogenic gem materials, not organic gem materials. So what are precious corals? Really simple, this is again a copy of the definition by the Sibju Coral Book, because the definition of precious coral for us in the trade is different than the definition of precious coral for biologists. Biologists, they say, it's their own right, that precious coral are all the corals that we can use for decoration. In jewelry, in the jewelry industry, a precious coral, the, this expression, as a very specific meaning. They are used for decoration, but they are only the ones that have a hard, uh, not shell, a hard uh, uh, substance, calcium carbonate, and they belong to very specific uh, taxonomical or biological, if you wish, groups that are those uh, complicated Latin names that you see on the bottom. Corallium, hemicorallium, and pleurocorallium. Uh, speaking Latin at this morning is quite tough. And for, for the jewelry industry, we consider eight species, maybe we can go up to 10, but that, that's too technical. But we consider eight species of precious coral only, and they all belong to one family called the Corallidae family, and that's it. The biologists, they have a wider definition. In jewelry, we have a much, uh, close and much specific definition because we have other corals that we use for decoration but they are not considered precious corals and in the jewelry industry we call them common corals and those common corals are numerous species and numerous varieties like the bamboo coral the sponge coral the steel aster coral Many of them, they are even treated and poly impregnated and dyed and stained to, so they can look and they can be usable and they can be fashionable, but not precious corals. So one thing is precious corals. The other thing is those common corals. And of course, we have also the reef corals. And reef corals, jewelry doesn't do artifacts using the corals from the reefs because the eight species of precious corals, they don't live on this ecosystem. They live in much deeper water, sometimes up to 2000 meters and reef corals, they live on really shallow waters. So we must distinguish, and this must be really clear, that uh, coral, the word coral collectively means a lot of species. Many of them are in the reefs, but precious corals, they are a small group of those more than 7,000 species. Remember, there were eight, eight to 10, if you want to be biological, very accurate, but 10 species. And the, the total of coral species is about more than 7,000. Many of them, they live on the reef. On the reef, on the jewelry, we don't see reef corals. So, this must be really clear that precious coral is one thing, common corals are another thing, and reef corals, totally different. So, but the, the problem is they all share the same uh, name, which is coral. And because they share the same name, when we listen about, oh, this is a coral jewelry, we think about corals from the reef, but those corals don't, don't come from the reef. Okay, so this is the first clarification of this webinar and on this chart you can see the only family of corals that are used as precious corals in jewelry are the ones that you see in red. The other taxonomical groups some of them they can be used but they are not considered precious corals. Uh, this clarification should be really made and clarified so make sure you take this home. Precious corals is one thing common corals and reef corals are totally different, okay? So those are the ones that we consider precious corals. And the only one we will address today 
is the Corallium rubrum from the Mediterranean. That in the trade, we call it Sardinian coral or Mediterranean coral. Those are the trade names that we can, we can call them. Curiously, we call them Sardinian, but it, it actually occurs not only in Sardinia, but almost everywhere in the Mediterranean. A curious thing is that uh, because of uh, coral has been around and available for so long that the oldest records of human use of corals date back to the Neolithic. So you see more than 6,000 6, years before common era, so 8,000 years ago. It goes really back on, on history. And it has been used since the Bronze Age and through uh, prehistory up until modern times. And sometimes, and this is curious, this is a Navaratna, which is a, a very strongly symbolic um, artifact uh, from, uh, from, uh, from India. One of the stones of the Navaratna is actually coral. And you ask me, does India produce red coral? And I say, no. So all the red coral that you see, the old red coral that you might see in very old artifacts in India, in China, in Tibet, they all came from the Mediterranean. In the 19th century, Asian coral was found around the Taiwan, around the Japan, etc. But the red coral from the Mediterranean, that's the one you see everywhere in the world on pre-19th century artifacts, with a few exceptions, of course. We, we see in Buddhism, uh, like, like I said, you see a lot of coral uh, being used and being cherished uh, in their culture. Also, and this is quite interesting, Benin, which is a very small kingdom in Nigeria, in equatorial Africa, the Portuguese, uh, I always speak about Portugal in my talks, but the Portuguese, when they were going down the coast of Africa to, to reach India, they would bring a few things to trade along the way. And they wanted gold, for instance, from, uh, from all those African stops. And one of the things the Portuguese brought to that area in equatorial Africa was coral. And this was in the 16th century. And uh, we know uh, documents exist that even in the south of Portugal, in Silves, there was um, coral factories working coral that the Portuguese were harvesting in Morocco. So uh, this really goes back in culture, not only in, uh, in what is today Italy, but also in the southern Portugal. And because of it, and look, this is the king of Benin, and he is dressed in coral. This is a ceremonial uh, outfit, I don't know, outfit, garment, I don't know what the correct word in English, but he's all dressed in coral. And if you see all the important people, they have coral, okay? So and this tradition that's still very strong in Nigeria came from the Portuguese influence. And this is a typical Nigerian uh, market necklace made in the 19th century that the Italians uh, built and they, they, they provided huge amounts of coral um, to that part of Africa. Still today, coral is quite important in Nigeria. For the Western world, everything, uh, our beliefs and our creeds about the mystical, magical powers of coral, they came from this book called Metamorphosis by Ovid. It's a classical mythology story. And the uh, and the story, it's, it's quite interesting. You can, I'm not going to tell you the story now. I told you before. You can Google it. It's quite an interesting story. But it's over there uh, for 2,000 years that our beliefs in Western culture about coral and the, um, the magical things of coral come actually from this thing. And coral became so strongly connected, even in Christianity, that we see in many paintings particularly paintings with the baby Jesus and the Holy Mary, we see coral, like you see this on the Madonna della Vittoria in the Louvre Museum. And this is a really famous painting from uh, Piero da Francesca, a uh, late 15th century painting. And we see, again, coral because of its uh, healing and protective powers. And again, uh, even this is a nice portrait with, uh, with a devout nun. With, uh, you see a rosary? a red rosary 
maybe this is the one, a rosary in coral, curiously with Mediterranean coral and with gold probably made in somewhere in India or in Sri Lanka. So it was Asian work with Mediterranean coral for Portuguese use. Interesting, quite international, international thing, this artifact over here. And we can uh, have so many examples of corals being used in Christian devotion. This is a quite interesting pix. Uh, the pix is like a, 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 um, a, a glass with a cover where, uh, the, Christ, where the priest uh, holds the sacred host for the Eucharist during Mass. And this is a typical work from Sicily. Uh, Caetano, I know that you are still in the room. This was made in Trapani, which is in the north part of Sicily, uh, north of Marsala, that by the way has a very nice wine. And um, this uh, kind of Trapani work is quite famous. And this is another example. This is a holy water stop that is on the Museo Nacional de Arte Antiga in Lisbon. When you come to Portugal, um, you go to Torre del Greco, to Enzo's uh, museum and eat pizza. But then you can come to Portugal to eat very nice sardines and, uh, and other things and visit this museum. And this is an outstanding uh, Trapani, a Sicilian work with Mediterranean coral. This is absolutely outstanding. Of course, but it's not only in Christianity, it's also in Islam. We have here praying beads, a tashbih, that uh, is made out of precious coral. I remember in November when I was in Jewelry, Arabia, in Bahrain, I saw a really nice uh, praying beads um, um, rosary made of precious coral from the Mediterranean being sold on, on the show. So because, and maybe, maybe some of you know, some of you don't know, uh, in the Quran, in the Holy Quran, there are not that many gemstones being mentioned. Of course, pearls is quite extensive, but there is also coral. So because of the mention of coral in the Quran, we have this relationship with praying beads. We also all know that the most, um, the most common uh, material for praying beads is amber, but coral you can see in very uh, sophisticated and more expensive praying beads are made of red coral. Also in Judaica, the Torah pointers, some of them are made also of coral. So as you see, you see coral in Buddhism, in uh, Hinduism, in Christianity, in Islam, in Judaica. It's global. It's really global. Even, of course, in art, I'm not going to spend much time with this necklace because Enzo will tell you all the story about this really famous, really world-class treasure that he holds in his museum, and you will see it in much detail. And of course, uh, because we are talking about art, we also have those contemporary artists like Jan Faber, that he made crazy uh, sculptures that today we look at them and we find it strange, but maybe in 200 years, it will be antique art as the other antique art that we see today was like strange when they were made in their own contemporary time. So uh, coral is also something used for art, not only jewelry. And by the way, if you go to Madeira, coral is a really nice beer. You can, maybe you can buy it online. I don't have shares of the beer, but uh, it's a nice beer actually. It's called coral from the Madeira island, where also they have a great Madeira wine. And Mediterranean coral, real quick, how much time do I have? I still have three minutes to go over this really quick. So it occurs in the Mediterranean, but also, also, and as you see, it's all over the Mediterranean, but also in the Atlantic, in the south of Portugal, down to Cape Verde, you can see these species with little differences that Enzo might explain. Today, to fish for coral, there are really strict rules. The General Fisheries Commissions for the Mediterranean, that is an official body um, connected with FAO, FAO is the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, they make compulsory that all coral must be harvested below 50 meters. The minimum trunk diameter is 7 millimeters. It must be only harvested by scuba divers, so no rov, no nets, it's by hand. And 
Diving below 50 meters, it's technical diving, not for everybody to achieve. And you must keep um, fishing logs, so and only in specific areas you can fish, and not all the countries allow fisheries. So this is quite strict. It wasn't like 100 years ago, but today it is quite strict. Many, many years ago, up until uh, the middle of the 20th century, coral was harvested using this kind of net. It's like a cross. It looks like a St. Andreas cross and has special nets. And it was really heavy. And this was invented by the Arabs. The Arabs were traditionally for hundreds of years the traditional harvesters and fishermen for coral in the Mediterranean. And they invented this device to, to fish selective parts of coral. As you see here on this picture, that coral is on the substrate, on the rocks, and they could, could bring those corals up. Today, this kind of fishing is forbidden, but this was traditionally used for hundreds of years, um, this, uh, this device. And because it was ingenious, it was smart, it was called in Italian, ingenio, because it was an ingenious uh, idea and invention by the Arabs. Just a curiosity, um, precious corals in the Mediterranean, they can go up to 1,000 meters. Of course, there is no fishing at 1,000 meters, but they can go up to 1,000 meters. And the typical fan size is about 15 centimeters, so it's smaller than my hand or about the size of my hand. And they, they are not really huge like the Asian corals that we see. Interesting, we have a lot of coral variations in Mediterranean coral, from the deep red to the orangey. Sometimes we can ha even have really rare pinkish one, but I'm not going to address those ones. You see this kind of orangey pinkish? This is another traditional, very old uh, color for the Mediterranean coral. When we have the bright red, that's the most important color in the Mediterranean um, species. And as with the Koya cultured pearls, for those of you that know what it is from Japan, above eight millimeters, this kind of coral is quite rare. So usually the Mediterranean corals come, comes in very small four, five, six, seven millimeter beads. When it comes to bigger beads like this one by Asael, uh, being held by Catarina Perez on this picture. This is quite huge, okay? This is significant size of a Mediterranean coral bead. This is quite huge. And uh, more examples of really huge pieces of uh, Mediterranean corals. And this is, when you actually know the product, you can appreciate if the size is spectacular or not spectacular. For instance, natural pearls from Bahrain, if you see a four millimeter one, it's normal. But if you see a eight millimeter or 10 millimeter, it's crazy big. So you must know exactly what it means. To end, and we are almost finishing, Chiaca Coral. Chiaca, it's the name of a town in southern Sicily, where many years ago, a certain very special deposit of dead coral was found. What do I mean by dead coral? We know that coral, they live on the substrate. On the, on, the, on the seabed, right? And if they die, the coral branch breaks and uh, goes to the seabed as other sediments. And when you have like a, a strong current, all those sediments, they are carried on the seabed. And eventually in off the coast of Shaka, there was something on the seabed like a, like a swimming pool, an empty swimming pool that all the debris, all, the, the, all those coral branches, they started to accumulate and they accumulated for thousands of years. And the amount of coral that was accumulated was quite significant. The reports say up to 1.4 thousand tons of coral was accumulated over thousands of years on that area. And eventually it, was, it started to be harvested. And usually because they are broken um, uh, branches of coral, they are really very small. And this is what they look like. Sometimes, because we know that uh, in Sicily, we have, uh, we have the, the Etna, uh, which is a, a really alive uh, a volcano near Catania, but we know that it's a volcanic area. And because of volcanic activity over thousands of years, we sometimes have those corals that are burned by volcanic activity, and the, it is called in the trade 
affumato means smoked coral, quite interesting. And this is what they look like. And traditionally they were worked by hand and they still are worked by hand in certain parts of Torre del Greco. And because those beads were really small, the way that they were drilled was using a, a, traditional, a traditional device um, that was like a bow drill. Um, and this, this is a really old picture in Torre del Greco of a lady drilling a coral bead, a coral shiaka bead. Uh, the, I, maybe this is a early 20th century, but this device goes back in history. And this is the kind of jewelry that we can see in shiaka coral from the traditional horns to, the, uh, to those very, very small uh, beads that they can sometimes be smaller than uh, one millimeter. It's absolutely amazing. And this is the kind of another orangey. You see the, the, the type of color is more orangey than the red uh, that we are used for the Mediterranean. But this is the typical uh, shiaka uh, coral. The world of coral is absolutely amazing. And uh, in this table, uh, we can see here the shiaka in the bottom and the Mediterranean here. All the others are not from the Mediterranean. So make sure that you understand that what we are looking at today is only the Mediterranean coral. The other species and the other varieties we didn't cover and we might cover in detail in the future, especially the one that everybody likes to know a little bit more about, which is angel skin and possibly also, also the, the, um, uh, the ox blood, the Aka coral from Japan, really expensive. So in conclusion, and the, this, uh, this is almost finished, uh, precious coral is historical biogenic, biogenic gem material. And uh, we cannot say that coral is the same as precious coral. It's totally, totally different. And the species that we are talking about in the Mediterranean is only one that we use in jewelry. It's called uh, Coralium rubrum, more a Latin word. And it has, as we saw, a very strong symbolism that it can be, they can see in Christianity, in Islam, in Judaica, in Buddhism, and also in Hinduism. It's absolutely uh, global. Uh, it has no frontiers, maybe because of the color that is red, uh, color of blood. It's also the coral of a football team that I don't like, which is Benfica, but uh, anyway, it's important color. Shaka coral, it's historically really important and also is the same species, but it, it came from dead branches that eventually died and those sediments accumulated for thousands of years uh, on the certain area in the Mediterranean, in the, off the coast of Shaka. And, uh, and that's it. And that's it. Uh, and we finished. And just before I, I give the floor to our beloved guest, Enzo Liverino, just making sure that you don't forget that next Friday we will have another great guest, Damien Cody, speaking about uh, precious opal. So this is it. I'm going to unshare my screen and I will call to the floor Vincenzo Liverino. <laughs> Rui. Yes. Oh, I forgot to <laughs> I forgot to push my microphone off. <laughs> so sorry. I I did okay. forget to, to I was talking introducing you and uh, nobody was listening to anything. Not even That was you. an excellent excellent introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, everyone Catano Cavalieri president of Sibjo he wished to take the floor. Um, um, for, a, for a few minutes before uh, we give the floor to Enzo Liverino. Ketano, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will take just a few seconds. First of all, I saw many uh, questions uh, on the Q&A area, and I suggest you to look at those questions because they are all very, very interesting. What I would like to say is this. Uh, first of all, uh, Sibjo is... Uh, I'm sure that all of you know, has put uh, uh, free of charge the downloading of all the Blue Books. Uh, so if you wish to download the Coral Blue Book or whatever book or all the books uh, from the website, please feel free to do that. Uh, second is uh, that I would like to emphasize that Sibjo 
is uh, the house of everybody who wants to join. So if you wish to join us, uh, please do. Uh, you can send email to all our uh, 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 email addresses, or if you want to visit our website, please do and send us all the email you want. And uh, you can also address uh, directly to each one of uh, the person, not only here, but listed in our uh, website, uh, president, uh, vice president uh, of sectors and commission and obviously to myself, if you wish, or to the General Secretariat. In other words, what I want to say is this. We are doing all these webinars uh, because we believe that specifically during this period, but not, not only that, but we will continue in the future, uh, uh, having direct contact with all of you is a great benefit for the industry. And we, are working for the industry. Now, the example is, in this specific moment, with Enjo itself, but also with Torre del Greco, where the true master of chorus are, and, and certainly Enzo is on top of the list, but there are also many others. The area is fantastic, and uh, I would like to uh, invite you to stay constantly connected with us, if you can because this is not only our privilege and our honor, but is the reason why we are doing whatever we do, and we do it pro bono. So we have to give back to the industry, meaning all of you, what we have get during our entire life. So please accept our modest contribution to each one of you and uh, we take care of the most important uh, element in our industry, which is uh, uh, you, which is the people, and we don't let anyone behind, but on the contrary, we push each one of us, each one of you to go forward as much as, as you can, as much as we can. Thank you very much, Enzo. Thank you very much, Caetano. Enzo, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting uh, uh, webinar. Uh, you learn a lot. Of, uh, uh, but please, uh, let me say, uh, let me make a correction. Uh, one important thing is that uh, you cannot compare uh, the pizza with uh, the, the Portuguese food because uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is there is nothing like uh, pizza and the, especially the folded pizza that you know very well <laughs> even your kids they know very well <laughs> cannot be compared with uh, with the uh, portuguese How, what you said before I don't remember. I improvise, so maybe ah, you improvise. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> so, Enzo, thank you very much for being with us in your museum. And uh, could you tell us uh, how did that collection uh, appeared? Uh, how uh, when did you start to build the collection? Well, uh, the collection uh, s started uh, with the, my grandfather, uh, Basilio Riverino and uh, was uh, uh, after uh, uh, taken it by uh, my uh, grandfather. My, uh, so the, the beginning was my grand-grandfather, Basilio Riveri, then from my grandfather, Vincenzo, uh, and uh, uh, then 80 percent, 75 percent of the collection was made by my father, who started to collect the pieces that he found all over the world. Um, when he was 16 years old, uh, uh, let, let me see if here there is the first pieces that he, he bought. Yes, it's there. Uh, how to... 
how to change here yes you see these small pieces mm -hmm. uh, is a shell cameo that uh, my father bought he was 16 years old when he bought it um, and and then he, he start to collect everything he found and then we start together uh, traveling all over the world every every time we found something interesting um, we 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 buy uh, and uh, uh, then in 1984 uh, my mother suggests to my father to make a, a museum and my father said that's a good idea and uh, so we uh, we made this museum under the uh, volcanic rock it takes uh, two years to 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 build and uh, we have made the six meter uh, below the floor uh, with the, with a very special uh, door that i can uh, oh the door the door is everyone this door is an absolutely amazing door let me show you how to yes this is nine tone door wow Yes, okay. Okay, let's come back inside. Wow, what the, that that is a really really it looks like a bank door, like a vault. Yes, the, the, it's very funny the story of this door because it was ordered ordered by the Bank of Italy in Naples, uh, in which now I am the uh, president of the headquarter in Naples. And uh, uh then they understand that they cannot uh, move uh, inside the bank because it was too heavy and too big so they uh, reject the order and we bought uh, with the discount of 50 percent fantastic enzo I, I see that in the back you have uh, coral branches so they are raw yes. coral branches and um are they from different areas of the Mediterranean? Yes. Yes. That That's one is um, actually I showed that one on my on my presentation. Yes. Uh, this is the classic shape of a uh, 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 Mediterranean coral that uh, commonly we call uh, Sardinian. This species was fished in Sardinian, and. Uh, all the coral from the Mediterranean is called a Sardinian just because the Sardinian coral has uh, all the uh, good characteristics as a shape, as a quality, as a color, uh, easy to work. So all the coral fish in the Mediterranean, we call it Sardinian. Interesting. And this Here, one? This one comes from uh, a French and Spanish coast, mostly from uh, close to French, in which you can see uh, that uh, the coral lives very fast. I mean, they grow up very fast. Uh, so fast that mo mostly in, uh, in uh, heightness. Uh, let me open so you can see better. Uh, the coral as life uh, means that born, uh, grow up and then die, uh, but uh, even when die the coral uh, becomes a good uh, basis for uh, new, uh, new branch, new coral. Uh, in fact, on, on the basis you can see the, there is some uh, coral that uh, was attacked by the uh, small animals and uh, and die and on on it 
born a new branch leaf. Mm. Um, here you can see the how the coral is uh, under the sea with the soft part uh, called the sarcosoma in which they live the polyps and inside and the, uh, the outside uh, part is very soft and the inside part is very hard and is the part that we can uh, we can work. And work interesting so um, uh, when when you see the raw branches, sometimes you can tell where they come from. If uh, you see the branch, if I see the branch, I can say that it comes from Morocco, from comes from Algeria, from Tunisia, from uh, Spain, from French, from Sardinia. Uh, um, uh, uh, like this, you can see this comes from uh, Algeria. Algeria coral is uh, more big, a uh, uh, little bit light, uh, but very big. This is a special piece of uh, uh, Mediterranean coral from uh, uh, Tunisia, Algeria. That is, is really big. Very, very big. Very big. Is, As you see, it's about uh, uh, 70 millimeter diameter. Wow. So Very special. That, that's uh, something like that. If it was work, would give like a, a 15 millimeter bead. That is already mm. a huge bead for a for Mediterranean coral. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yes. Definitely. Yes. And so throughout history, all those coral branches, they have been worked. And, uh, the, and the, I, show, I remember I've shown during the webinar some work from Trapani that uses really small pieces of Mediterranean coral um, uh, in, a, in a very artistic way. And uh, so that all that coral, oh, fantastic. That's a holy water, another holy water uh, scalp. Scoop, scalp. I don't know how to say in English. Yes. And that's Trapani. This is a typical uh, work. The uh, Trapani school, they were specialized in uh, uh, religious uh, uh, object or art. Exactly, exactly. Uh, wow, this is a really delicate shrine. That is one of my favorites. Uh, it's really delicate. And uh, interestingly, see, we can see can in, be, in many this museums can be of carried, the world. This can be carried outside from the church, just closing these. And wow. can bring out. Here, there is a chalice. Then we have an heraldic uh, ordered, but maybe from some uh, royal uh, family in Sicily. And uh, also in Trapani, they made the nativity. And this is a shepherd, a shepherd, uh, probably this was part of uh, the so-called the coral mountain, uh, a Trapani's work that was a gift for uh, uh, Philip II, the King of Spain, in uh, 1570, by the uh, Vice King of Sicily, made by Mediterranean coral. Is uh, is one piece. Wow.
is amazing because it's one piece. Enzo, just to let you know, I'm, I'm not speaking because when I speak, the video goes to my face and people, they, they like to see the pieces, not my face. So I will try not to speak and uh, all, all the microphone is yours. And uh, if you wish Thank me you. to say something, I, I will intervene. But if I speak, I, I've noticed that only my face and people don't want to see me. This is a Golgotha. This is Jesus Christ. Then we have other uh, small work. This is uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. This is the king of Naples. This was used as an uh, uh, umbrella, part of the umbrella. Okay, and then we go to Neapolitan jewelry here. I don't know how to zoom. Huh? Ah, one thing is this that you mentioned before, that was a kind of uh, um, um, money used by Portuguese. That they buy in uh, to the Greco, and they, they use as money when they uh, travel to uh, Africa or other country uh, where the color was very well noted. And uh, so, uh, for instance, in Nigeria, they bring they they they, they pay uh, with one bench of this a uh, certain quantity of silver that they can uh, they export to uh, uh, China, where the, the the silver was the most appreciated. Uh, 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 and uh, va value uh, metal. Can I ask Look. you a question, Enzo? Why some coral there has a different, more pinkish color? Is it because they are older or they are selected pieces? of a more pinkish uh, coloration? No. Uh, when you see this kind of a color, more pinkish, means that they come from Shaka. Uh, when uh, it's uh, red, it, they, they come from uh, other country. Uh, in that uh, time, in that century, mostly they fish in uh, uh, Livorno area, Genoa area, um, uh, by uh, Torre del Greco fishermen, uh, and uh, uh, some of them uh, was worked in uh, Torre del Greco, uh, especially this is a very important uh, jewelry set that you showed before. Uh, leaves and uh, fruit, we call it uh, uh, this kind of jewelry in uh, coral. This was ordered by uh, Josephine, uh, by Carolina Bonaparte, the young sister of Nap uh, Napoleone. Um, Carolina Bonaparte was uh, wife of uh, um, Joaquino Murat. Uh, that in uh, the beginning uh, uh, of uh, 18th century, he was the king of Naples. Uh, just because the relationship between uh, Joaquino Murat and Napoleon Bonaparte was not so good, uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, due to the uh, fact that uh, Joaquino Murat was very handsome guy, 
very beautiful man. Napoleon was a little bit uh, fat and uh, no, no, uh, like almost you, right? <laughs> and, um, uh, Carolina, uh, to make a diplomatic uh, 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 relation uh, between the brother and his husband, he ordered this necklace for the wife of Napoleone, uh, Josephine uh, Bernays. Unfortunately, when the necklace was ready, Napoleone divorced uh, from uh, Josephine. So the necklace was uh, not uh, um, uh, delivered to, to her and remained in a Napoli shop. And uh, um, 60, 70 years ago, my father bought from this shop this uh, uh, set, and the uh, here is another important uh, piece, uh, another kind of uh, uh, jewelry made in Naples, are uh, these using uh, uh, coral cameo or um, like that one, that are a tiara and the bracelet. Enzo, before I don't want to interrupt, but uh, you just passed a, a necklace with uh, what appeared to be really, really small drilled beads, uh, like, uh, like uh, one millimeter of, yes, that is the one. What, what is, is that the one that you were mentioning that has thousands of beads and what is the size of, uh, of those beads? The size of these beads is uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 millimeter. Means that the drill uh, should be 0 0.2, 0 0.3. It's something that we are not able to understand how it was made. So uh, since uh, 10 years ago, me and my father, we suppose that that necklace was made, made from Shaka, was worked in uh, China, because in China they, 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 are, they, they, they are able to do this kind of work. But uh, in the last few years, as I travel a lot in, uh, 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 Saudi Arabia and uh, especially in Bahrain, uh, I saw uh, in some uh, factory where they uh, drill and string the uh, natural pearl that they fish in uh, that area. I, I saw people uh, using uh, a special tool. Uh, um, and uh, drilling and uh, stringing uh, these sides of uh, beads. Uh, and because of this, I understand that uh, the official date of the discovery of uh, Shaka Korafid by, was by Sicilian fishermen. This is the official date. But it's also official that the inventor of the coral fishing tool, the ingenio, as you showed before, which means ingenious were the Arabs on the 10th century. The, the use of shaka coral in Neapolitan jewelry dates back to late 1700 century, thanks to the king of Naples. In that time, they made special law to help uh, open new factory with uh, financial support and elimination of taxes. So it's clear that the Shaka Corps was founded by the Arabs who kept the discovery secret. They sold it to the Greco and teach them the way to drill the coral bit. Uh, with their method, they used to drill their precious nature pair. Let's say something more about Shaka Coral. This was not a bench, but a deposit composed of various uh, layers, more than 30 meters high, in a kind of a natural settling tank, only a few miles wide. 
all the small branch of coral broken by earthquake or some marine volcanic eruption were transported by underwater currents that carried branch from various countries such as Algeria, Tunisia and even Sardinia. Thank you, Enzo. Really, really nice. One, one thing that um, you, did, you did it really well now was keeping the phone as steady as you can so, so uh, we, we don't get like seasick <laughs> on, the, on looking at the trembling thing. So uh, sorry to interrupt, you were, you were then showing us more, more uh, items made in, uh, in Naples and maybe also in Genova uh, because there are Genovese material and also a Napolitan uh, way of working the coral. Yes. In, uh, until the beginning of the uh, 19th century, uh, there was the uh, uh, biggest factory uh, in, in never exists in the world, and the name was Raffaele Costa. Uh, nothing to do with the Costa Cruz. Uh, uh, but they just shared the name. Uh, this company was uh, so big uh, that in the I have we, we still have uh, all the uh, invoice, uh, the contability, the accounting of this uh, company. And the year, I don't know if you can see where there is a, a letter exchange of uh, letter between uh, Costa and the uh, company in the United States, the name was Frost and Son, in which they ordered thousand and thousand necklaces of coral, uh, speci especially for uh, uh, American Indian uh, market, uh, that was very uh, uh, popular in the time. The uh, kind of necklace, uh, that they uh, prepared was uh, this that you can see how the way the uh, the, 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 the sales people of this company they they go to visit uh, the customers and uh, they take order from uh, this as a sample set here yeah, there is even the price, 10 lire. This cost uh, 17 lire that in that time was $3.79. So Enzo, those are our um, um, works made in Genoa. So it's uh, uh, interesting that uh, all of the sudden Torre del Greco became the most important uh, um, capital of uh, coral manufacturing. Did it have to do with the fishing, uh, with fishermen being from Torre del Greco, or the artisans being Torre del Greco, or both? Oh, let me change the video, yes. No, the, in the beginning, the Torre del Greco people was just a fisherman. They uh, used to uh, fish coral uh, from all the Mediterranean, and they sell it to uh, Livorno factory and the Genova factory. Uh, so th this kind of relation, uh, let them understand that they can even work the coral, and they start to uh, they start to uh, 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 not only uh, make the standard beats like we make today, but to make also piece of art like we saw before, and. Uh, this thanks especially because of the uh, passion and the love for coral of the French um, the king that we have had, uh, like Joaquin Murat. And thanks also to 
one uh, or, originated uh, man um, that uh, was uh, Bartolome Martin. Uh, oh, sorry, my, my uh, sorry. Uh, but Bartolome Martin, uh, that was a, a, a merchant in uh, in uh, Marseille, but in uh, uh, 1805, uh, following the strong decline of coral processing caused by French Revolution, he landed in Naples. Somebody said uh, that he uh, he fell in love with uh, uh, Torre de Greco lady, uh, uh, so he decided to move to Torre de Greco. And he obtained a 10 year uh, the privy from uh, King Ferdinand III of Bourbon to start a factory for coral processing using a coral fish by Napolitan, with the obligation to instruct some young people of the town. So it was that uh, Torre de Greco linked to his name not only the coral fish, but also in uh, processing. The Reale Scuola di Incisione e Lavorazione del Corallo was established in Torre del Greco with a uh, visiting professor coming from uh, art world and uh, from other coral manufacturing uh, centers like Marseille, Genova, and Trapani to train the local coral artisan with more refined technical and artistic skill. So, uh, interesting. One thing before we go into the questions and answers, I would like you to explain what is this? Ah, this is a horn. That is a uh, uh, Neapolitan symbol of uh, uh, lucky. And uh, for us, is a, a way to share with a friend and a relative uh, the fortune, the lucky. So it's uh, 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 the, 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 it's a kind of uh, uh, charm. uh, charms that was not only used uh, as a single horns, but uh, was also used in ornaments like I will show you here, also before you have a show. Here, or even in a tiara, there is some tiara with the horns. And so funny, I will show you now something very new. The collaboration that started three years ago with a very famous um, artist, Belgian artist named Jan Fabre, that he changed the story of a coral. This is a cross made by horns, with small horns. This is fantastic way to settle these pieces because the horns looks like they are moving, looks like they are uh, uh, anemone. Um, it's leaving pieces and was made by Jan Fabre. Uh, the coral in the past was used mostly uh, for uh, uh, classic jewelry was never used in the, um, the new art in the... Um, so Jan Fabre, he, he, uh, let's say that he, he opened a new chapter in the story of the coral. And uh, here we saw uh, the first pieces that we made together. And then here we have a school Oh, that reminds the... me somebody. What? It reminds me of somebody. 
Not to Gaetano. No, absolutely not. His devilish uh, uh, school made the, uh, with the roses, more roses, and then a big heart. covered by leaves. And uh, before the COVID was uh, arriving here, the fourth pieces that uh, we will add it. It is a fantastic pieces. And then we have made now, uh, uh, um, we, last year we have made the four pieces that we donate to uh, Pio Monte della Misericordia, that is a foundation in Naples. And uh, there, you show something before in your PowerPoint. There was uh, uh, four gigantic uh, pieces that me and Gianfranco D'Amato, uh, we donated together with the young father to the church uh, and was dedicated to uh, a Caravaggio painting that is in this church. The seven... Uh, Le Sette Opere della Misericordia. Thank you very much, Enzo. Uh, shall I, um, uh, we are basically, we have 19 minutes over my time. I'm going to launch a poll to everybody. Uh, so it's like a five questions, uh, just to make sure every important thing that we've mentioned are really consolidated and, uh, and we will go directly to the Q&A, to the questions and answers. The, the poll, the quiz is anonymous, so you don't, don't mind if you don't get it right. Enzo, I've got here um, in line the, uh, the uh, head of collections of the Museo Nacional de Arte Antiga, the most important uh, decorative art museum in Lisbon, Luisa Pnalva. And she's, she has the microphone already and she would love to ask you a few questions because she runs a museum and you have a lovely museum and you've been introduced by email that I know, but Luisa, the floor is yours. You can ask whatever you wish to Enzo. Um, uh, hi, Enzo. I, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rui. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you'll hear me well because my, I'm uh, calling from an iPad and it's quite old. But anyway, uh, I would like to say that we have uh, a beautiful tiara in the, in the Royal Collections that probably one day you, if you come here you can see it if you haven't seen it yet but uh, in the museum we have that um, that uh, piece that uh, Rui show show us um, quite a few minutes ago that is um, um, Rui can you show us the, the the piece I would like to ask something about it because he has two two types of coral and I would like to understand exactly that one and I would like to see to uh, to ask you if you can tell me something about the red one, so and the, the pinkish one, that figure in, in the in the bottom, that uh, the a few years ago, a few years, decades ago, the the piece was removed because they thought it was a, um, a different part of the of the piece. I don't know why because I, I attach it again. But I would like to know where did these corals came from. In your opinion, obviously. Uh, I never saw these pieces. Uh, uh, looks like a kind of a, a rare uh, angel skin Mediterranean coral. This is very, very rare. It's albino kind of a coral, an anomalous color of the coral that sometimes is uh, found in the Mediterranean. And the pinkish one too. The the, kind the of pinkish smell. one. I mean the pinkish yeah. one. The red shaka. one is a shaka. The shaka. red one around is a shaka. But the, the one, pink... the other one is very pinkish, very pale. But it's a pink... yeah. The 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 figurine uh, down looks like Sirena, or I, I cannot see very well. It's a lady, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's it... holding the, the the shell. It's holding the shell. Yes. The, this is, uh, should be Mediterranean coral, but anomalous color. <clears throat> the one uh, uh, that normally in uh, 
Asia coral is a called angel skin. But there are some cases uh, like in Asia, angel skin is an anomalous color of coral. Uh, Sometimes, but more rare, it happens also in the Mediterranean. Okay. Well, that's a good reason for you to come here and, and see it for yourself. You're invited to come to, to the museum, all thank of you. You're all invited. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I'll, I'll take the chance to say that our jewelry collection has over 200, 200 no, 2,500 jewels, and mostly Portuguese and Spanish jewels, obviously, but uh, it has been restored and, and analyzed by Rui, which I thank, thank him profoundly. Uh, all of the stones were, were analyzed by him. And it will be shown, it was supposed to be shown in 15 days for the, again, for the first time in one year and a half. But unfortunately for this, it's impossible. But uh, I hope until the end of the year, we have our exhibition, jewelry exhibition again, back again in the museum. And it's really worth coming to see it. Um, and one more question, Enzo, please. Uh, I have, we have in the museum, I don't have anything, but the museum has also um, uh, a chalice and it had, needs to be restored. Is it possible to, but it, it misses some of those small coral, uh, not beads because it's more work than a bead, but is it possible to find them or to, to have some way to replace them because it, it has a significant amount of, uh, of lags? Yes, it's possible. Uh, uh, we, we have a spare part. We, we, mm. we have a spare part to, to repair. We, especially my father, used to have a, a spare pipe, original spare pipe, from yes. Shaka, uh, to, just to repair uh, this kind of uh, artwork. Okay, so I'll send you an email afterwards and we'll keep in touch. Who my is pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity. My pleasure. For all of this, this is, has been amazing. Truly the highlights of our weeks, I'm sure for, for everyone. Thank you, Vizinha. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for being here in the room. And uh, you had the privilege to make uh, personal questions to, to Enzo. Now I'm, I'm, going to, I, I'm going to look into the Q&A. And, &A and uh, maybe, Enzo, uh, uh, there is a few, a few uh, questions here that you might respond. Enzo, there is Antoinette Matlins, and she's from Sicily. Uh, originally, uh, Bonanno, her father was from Sicily. She asking you, um, is the, the red coral from a Mediterranean dyed? What is the treatment? And if there is any treatment on the on Mediterranean coral? Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, the question is? Uh, if the, cor the Mediterranean coral is dyed to become red, or uh, is that no, 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 absolutely not. Can be dyed, can be dyed, uh, but it's not a genuine coral. It's not a, 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 originally the, the all the Mediterranean coral is red, can be light red, can be dark red, but it's always red. Uh, can be dyed, but no, normally they, they use uh, not Mediterranean coral to, to make it. Uh, uh, d deep red. They they use bamboo coral, uh, but the technique is, is, is more uh, Chinese technique to do that, and uh, uh, it, it will uh, not definitively remain forever. It's something that uh, with the uh, year will change, will uh, come out. So uh, that's why Sebejo has a space has made a, a, book, a blue book on coral in which we uh, define the rules uh, that are allowed on the, on the treatment. Uh, mostly uh, we say that uh, uh, there is no uh, any kind of treatment allowed on coral. If you want to sell as natural precious coral. Thank you very much, Enzo. Another question from an anonymous attendee asking you how do you how to keep and how to maintain coral jewelry? 
uh, for instance, it must be like a consumer or a person that has uh, rings or necklaces or whatever. What should one do to clean and to maintain our coral jewelry? I can suggest to don't use uh, on uh, skin together with the perfume or cream or uh, to go to the swimming pool or uh, to the uh, seaside with the coral necklace because it has biogenic material can easily lose the shining. Uh, in case you, you the, the jewelry will lose the shining don't use soap, don't use uh, nothing. Uh, you can only try to use uh, uh, water uh, with soft, uh, 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 soft, uh, soft leather. And, uh, and uh, uh, if should, uh, uh, if uh, should be um, uh, shining again, it's a, I suggest to bring it back to the uh, shop and the, the shop will uh, send to the factory that have produced that necklace. Uh, some factory they will charge for it. For instance, we don't charge our customers. We, when we sell some coral to our uh, uh, customers, we say that for all the life, we will repair, we will uh, be shining again for free. Um, interesting. Enzo, I've got here a few questions that uh, many people are asking it that are the same, which is how can they visit the museum and uh, where can they see the video that I've shown on the, of the museum? Where can they see that video again and share it on, on their social media? Uh, well, it was uh, something that I think that we was uh, talking about a few days ago. Uh, as we have produced many video, and you, you also have, maybe to make a, a YouTube channel to wh where to put uh, all the video that we have produced, even this uh, webinar. Of course, we can put on YouTube. On we have. You are more expert than me on the social media. So uh, this, is, this is what we want, uh, that the people uh, know what is the coral, uh, to, to, to share with the people uh, our knowledge, uh, give information uh, and uh, be prepared to uh, make education on, on it. And how can people visit your museum? I know that it's a private museum, it's not open to the public. So how can people make an appointment to book a, a, a visit? Uh, in, until a couple of years ago, uh, as a private museum, we open only uh, by appointment. Then for a couple of years, uh, for uh, let's say two years, my, my son, he tried to organize uh, uh, the, the museum, the visit to the museum that uh, uh, also made by a pond map, but uh, for group, uh, but it, it takes time. It is quite, uh, it is quite a big uh, job. So, but anyway, uh, by appointment, by appointment it will be the easy way. Hmm. So, uh, question number one, while Enzo is looking at the Q&A, uh, Mediterranean coral, precious coral is known as, not angel skin, angel skin, Enzo said, it's like the albino varieties of many species, mostly the uh, Pleurocorallium elatius, from, uh, mostly from the Japanese waters that we know as angel skin. Cherasuolo is the same, it's another trade name in Italian for that kind of Pleurocorallium elatius coral, but when it is salmon colored, not uh, pink, it is of course Sardinia, and that was the right answer. Uh, number two, the use of Mediterranean coral goes back to, it then goes back to the Neolithic, it's really quite old, goes uh, more than 10,000 years 
the first reports on the use of coral by mankind. It's really quite old. And Sheka coral, question number three, is the living color variety of Corallium rubum? Yes. No, sorry. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> it's false. And that there was one question is what's the, the, the difference between living coral and dead coral? The question is, the, the, uh, the reply is quite simple and goes into this answer. Sheka coral or the coral from the Sheka deposit off the coast of Sheka in Sicily are branches of coral that died and they were uh, transported by, by the current and deposited on a certain area. And that's why we call it dead coral because when it was caught, it was already dead. And by the way, in Japan, there was a, uh, there was a quite nice uh, um, uh, carbon-14 um, uh, study on coral harvested from Japan, proving that some of that coral was 5,000 years old, also dead coral. So question number three, it was false. So uh, Shiaka is not living coral, Shiaka is already dead coral on a sedimentary deposit. And uh, question number four, the world capital of Mediterranean coral is, of course, Torre del Greco, where if you travel there, uh, and if you take me, I will take you to this very small pizzeria that has the best pizza margarita portfolio that you can ever imagine. True or not true, Enzo? Uh, can you repeat? That uh, in Torre del Greco is not only the capital, the world capital of uh, precious coral, manufactured precious coral in the Mediterranean, but also the world capital of pizza. Ah, yes. Portafolio pizza. And the curious one of the replies was Lisbon, and the uh, four people, they were very gently voted like uh, Lisbon is the capital of coral. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe some relative of yours. I'm sure it was my father or it was friends, I'm sure. And uh, question number five, precious coral is the same as reef coral? No at all. One, the, the corals that are, are living on the reef, they live on shallow water and they are not used in jewelry. The corals that we use in jewelry, the jewelry trade, they are harvested below 50 meters. So totally different ecosystem. So they are not the same. Thank you very much for doing the quiz. I hope that at least those questions you will take home correctly. There is somebody here asking, uh, what uh, is, are there any books on coral? And uh, let's see if I can, uh, ho hold on a second. I have here a lot of, uh, of <coughs> things. I'm going to show you. They are out of print, if, if I know correctly. But this is, this is why I met Enzo Liverino, because I bought this book when I was a student at GMA back in the 1990s. It was the only book available on coral. It was made by his father. And I bought it and I met Enzo in 2011, I think in Vicenza, uh, in the Sibjo Congress at Vicenza Oro. And I saw his badge, uh, Liverino, and I said, oh, Liverino, are you, are you related to, to this Liverino, say it was my father, and uh, then we became friends. And uh, his father also published this one, uh, more recent. Uh, this is in Italian. Io posso io capito l'italiano, napolitano, però capito tutto, capisco come si dice. And this is Italian. <laughs> and there is also in uh, Japanese, right or Chinese, Enzo. But this is yes, also sir. out of print. And uh, those are the two biggest uh, authoritative books on coral that I know. So if you find them on Amazon, uh, maybe you can find them. And if you give me one million dollars, I can maybe I can sell you this. But uh, that, that that because they are out of print. And right, Enzo. Yes, right. And I hope uh, it's. Uh not only my dream but it's also our dream uh, me and you uh, are here that we are trying to republish a new uh, coral book but we will do 
um, before I, I close the webinar, the floor is yours, Caetano, for the closing remarks. Well, first of all, let me uh, say that, um, well, about you, Rui, uh, uh, I mean, you are a performer, but I understand that you like pizza much more than coral. Uh, but still, there still there are two things that are, you know, the base of the one and the other, which is the red color, one of tomato, one of, of coral. <laughs> Uh, the mozzarella, of course, is. Uh, but apart apart that, uh, uh, I would like to thank Enzo, of course, because I saw from the comments uh, uh, a lot of it. Still, you know, they they left. Uh, they are leaving a great messages. Uh, um, I think that. Uh, uh, we are doing uh, apparently the right thing in giving uh, uh, extra uh, enthusiasm and extra tools to the people to think about our fantastic world of jewelry business. You know, everything, everything we do and everything we produce is uh, for sure a piece of art. And the art is lying in two different areas. One is the capacity to manufacture a, a piece of jewelry, and the other one is the romance, the legend, the story that is behind, which is probably one of the most important part of it. If the people would have much more knowledge and when i refer to the people i refer to the consumers i believe that our business especially after this lockdown will flourish again will flourish fantastically and it will be on top of the element in order to let each one of us dream thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Caetano. Thank you for the support that Sibjo from day one uh, supported these webinars. As you say, it was, uh, uh, this is not very technical. It was more to, was like a performing to entertain. But as you well said, if the consumers and everybody has a little bit of more knowledge and appreciation, the perception of of whatever we do in the industry goes up and up and we we might be even more competitive with our competition of other industries that are fighting for the same place in the ecosystem so thank you for your inspiring words thank you for your support and uh, thank you for being there for almost two hours and you are a really busy man and um, not traveling but your uh, your uh, three or four phones are always ringing at the same time, thank you for being there for the, for the whole webinar. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the support that Sibjo has given me since day one. So thank you very much indeed. My pleasure and my honor. Thank you so much, Roy. My pleasure too. So to everyone, thank you very much for being there. And um, we will see each other on Friday with Damien Cody for uh, the Precious Opal webinar. But before that, um, Edward Johnson and Steve Benson, they are hosting um, another Sibjo um, webinar on how to survive after the lockdown. So if you are business orientated, make sure you also book for that one. But absolutely, you book for the Opal one on Friday at the same time, uh, two uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. So thank you very much for being there. Thank you very much for all your support. Thank you a lot, Enzo Liverino, for being uh, with us today. It was a real privilege and thank you, Caetano, for all the support. So bye-bye to everyone. Bye-bye.